In the previous lesson, I introduced the Malmquist uh, productivity index and its uh, decomposition at the theoretical level. So I'll continue in this, uh, this lesson to then uh, discuss how we can apply the frontier estimation techniques to actually compute this Malmquist index and the, the required distance functions for decomposing it. So uh, before proceeding, I briefly summarize just what we have discussed uh, so far. So uh, I want to emphasize that the growth accounting and the classic index number techniques are very easy to compute. Uh, if you have data in Excel, you can just calculate them by Excel. So I emphasized already before that those, uh, those methods do not really require any estimation or optimization whatsoever. So, so they can be just calculated. Uh, that's not necessarily a negative feature by any means. So, so by, by the fact that I do not uh, discuss the calculation so explicitly, it's just that, uh, that I believe that they are really relatively easy to implement and they don't re require so much uh, um, attention in that respect. So, so those are really uh, viable approaches if, uh, if uh, reliable and uh, price information is available. So I will consider more this uh, Malmquist index approach or more broadly shadow price approach uh, because that closely connects to this uh, DEA and uh, SFA and stoned approaches that we have considered in the previous lessons. And uh, I, will, I will mainly focus on the uh, standard Malmquist index, noting that, of course, there are many, many, many variants of the Malmquist index idea in the literature, including this uh, shadow price Fisher that we discussed in the previous lesson. I'll briefly mention this um, idea of global Malmquist in the following, uh, following slides. And I also note that uh, in uh, recent years, there is a relatively popular approach referred to as Malmquist Lewenberg uh, indicator. This is simply the same kind of Malmquist index that we have considered, but uh, in contrast to using those uh, uh, radial output uh, oriented uh, distance functions or input oriented distance function, this Malmquist Lewenberger indicator uses the directional distance function. But that's, that's a straightforward extension of the uh, usual Malmquist index idea, in my view. So let me just remind you the, the decomposition of the Malmquist index and the, and the required uh, components. Uh, so uh, this, uh, this uh, decomposition was framed in terms of the um, output, uh, output distance function. And recall that we need, uh, need, this, um, need to compute various uh, values of the distance functions to calculate this decomposition. So uh, and notice also that we need to have both variable returns to scale and constant returns to scale versions of the, of the distance function. So I'll briefly elaborate how this can be done uh, using the frontier estimation techniques and starting one from uh, DEA. So I just mentioned this slide that notice that when you have calculated the values of the distance function, you would still need to go to this, uh, this kind of uh, uh, formulations which again can be done in Excel like, like this uh, traditional index numbers like Fisher index. So we, we, uh, I will next focus on just uh, how, to, how to get these values of the, of the distance function from the input output data. So I don't go to the, all of the technical details. I'll just, uh, uh, just briefly discuss the strategy of how, how you can compute it. So, we have considered uh, uh, data envelopment analysis and how to measure efficiency or how to how to compute efficiency scores in DEA. So we can directly apply this kind of uh, efficiency scores computed in DEA to then calculate this uh, Malmquist index and its and its components. So the usual approach in in the DEA literature is to uh, but we have some, some uh, yearly cross-sections of data. So I assume that we have some capital T time periods. Typically it's years, but of course it could be also months or weeks or days or whatever. So in DEA, usually these, uh, these uh, cross-sections, so each year is modeled completely separately. And uh, therefore, uh, if we calculate the values of the, of the distance function in period T, using the frontier of, of uh, year T and the 
input output data of, of year T. So in that sense, we just treat each cross section separately as, as so in some sense, we would estimate then uh, capital T different uh, DEA models. And uh, notice that this is, of course, enough for measuring the efficiency change. So for a given unit, for example, for a given country or given firm, we can we can see what was the efficiency score in period T and we can see the efficiency score in period T plus one. So then then the um, change in efficiency is simply uh, or this efficiency change component is simply the ratio of this uh, uh, efficiency scores efficiency score in period T plus one divided by efficiency score in period T. So that is the uh, indicator of how much efficiency has changed from period T to period T plus one. Uh, similar kind of comparisons we can also make, uh, we can first calculate the scale efficiency by comparing the constant returns to scale and variable returns to scale efficiency scores. And then we can take the ratio to see how much the scale efficiency has potentially changed. And all of this can be easily done with this kind of usual DEA, uh, DEA techniques that we had considered earlier in, in, in the theme number two. So one complication that arises, though, when we want to do the Malmquist index, and particularly the, the technical change component, is that we need to also compare what I have here indicated as intra-period comparisons. So if we have observations of year period T, we need to also compare those observations to the frontiers in period T minus one and frontier in period T plus one, as I have indicated. So Notice that this uh, superscript with this distance function d, the t minus one or, or t plus one, that refers to this uh, time period uh, of the frontier, whereas these uh, superscripts in x and y, so, so those input output data, that refers to this uh, uh, time period of the evaluated unit. So we need to make this kind of uh, counterfactual comparisons that what would be the efficiency of the unit observed in period T relative to its previous year's uh, frontier and also relative to its uh, uh, next uh, period's frontier. So to compute that in, in uh, DEA, we need to then uh, adjust the reference set. So here is an example for, the, for this latter distance function. So if we measure, uh, measure the distance from the period T observation I relative to the frontier of uh, period t plus one, then I have here in this um, linear programming formulation, I have highlighted with red color that these data matrices x and y are adjusted so that uh, they these data come from uh, period t plus one. So we compare then this uh, observation i in period t relative to the other, other units observed in period t plus one. And then when we compare these distance functions, then, then we can see that how much the frontier has shifted from period T to period T plus one. So these kind of intra-period comparisons we need to compute for all, all observations and uh, both uh, uh, backwards towards period T minus one and forwards towards uh, period T plus one. And when we have made that kind of calculations, then we have all the necessary elements for the for the Malmquist index and its components. So also the, the Malmquist index, so for measuring the uh, productivity change, we need also these intra-period values. So in practice, if we, if we do this uh, typical DEA approach, uh, in my view, um, uh, a shortcoming of this procedure is that in, in many applications, the we might find at least in some years that technical change is negative. Um, I have some experience from uh, uh, applications to agriculture and, and farms where very often, perhaps for, for example, due to, to weather variations, then, then uh, this technical change can be negative and positive and fluctuate uh, uh, very heavily from one, one year to another. And uh, in that sense, the, the reason for this is that these yearly cross sections are treated as completely independent of each other. And another thing is, of course, we know that DEA is sort of quite sensitive to the 
uh, most extreme observations. So if, they, if we have some outliers or if we have some random noise in our data, then, uh, then this can, of course, happen. And in some sense, this, um, for example, weather, uh, weather conditions in agriculture, if they are not really controlled in the, in the DEA model, they will end up to this kind of as, as a random noise that can cause this kind of, uh, kind of weird fluctuations. But then, if you think about uh, technical progress, then uh, or technical change in general, it's kind of uh, worth to ask: that is, is it possible that technical change is negative in the short term? Are really some production technologies forgotten overnight, or in the period of one year? Uh, what about the fluctuations? Are some some of these technologies then reinvented in just a period of another year? So that kind of issues. Uh, uh, can be hard to believe in uh, in an empirical application that why why should we have some kind of fluctuations or technical regress over time? So there are several ways to try to try to alleviate this issue. For example, uh, doing some kind of uh, outlier detection or removing some kind of outliers from DEA, but that doesn't necessarily help if uh, if uh, if we have, for example, very large this kind of weather related. Uh, variations from, from one period to another. In that case, basically all, all firms are outliers to, to some extent. So one, one way to make it a little bit more, uh, more robust would be uh, this um, global Malmquist index approach that I mentioned at the, at the beginning. So that differs from this uh, usual implementation of DEA where you treat this each cross section separately in this global Malmquist index, the idea is that you pool all your observations to the to the reference set together, and then then measure distance relative to this sort of global frontier. So uh, so here I have illustrated the idea. So basically, then if you use this kind of global Malmquist index approach, you can just have a one single large DEA model that has all these time periods in the same sample. And, and you measure efficiency relative to this kind of global frontier. Of course, this global frontier will be typically represented by the, the, the last year or a couple of last years in your sample if, if there is technical progress. So it takes, in some sense, the best, uh, best practices over this entire, entire time, time period under study. Uh, so that can be used for measuring the uh, productivity change using just the distance functions relative to this kind of pooled frontier. Uh, so that, that can be used for measuring the, the Malmquist index. However, for this uh, decomposing this uh, technical change, so the frontier shift, we cannot I isolate from this, at least not very, very easily. So that would be basically then blurring this distinction between technical change and efficiency change, but it would allow have this kind of overall productivity change. Then, of course, there would be many, many possibilities to, to further extensions. But at least in some sense, this kind of uh, heavy fluctuations in the technical change component, uh, particularly, have been recognized as a, as a limitation in the DEA approach. What about the parametric estimation then? So, to keep things simple, I'll, I'll just uh, recall this uh, Solos uh, uh, model. So, I have now the uh, capital and labor as the as the input variables and uh, assume Higgs neutral technical change. So this is just a solo model in log terms. And I have here introduced also the random error term epsilon that can capture both inefficiency and noise. You can think about it as the composite error term of the of the stochastic frontier models that we have considered. So if we then proceed further and impose some parametric structure. So as an illustration in this uh, uh, second equation, I have assumed the Cobb Douglas production function for the capital and labor. And uh, I simply introduced the time trend. So here it is a linear trend, but it could be also some other functional forms that say polynomial time trend. So, so we could have just the time trend to, to model the technical change component in this kind of solo style framework. So that would be a very, very straightforward way to model uh, technical change in the parametric setting. And uh, similarly, of course, we can then uh, apply it to, to measuring and decomposing the, 
um, productivity change. So firstly, of course, technical change would be captured by, the, by this uh, parametric time trend. So we can think about this uh, uh, alpha parameter, alpha coefficient as the as a percentage change in the in the in the technology, or if we take expo exponential function of alpha, then we can get also this kind of technical change component of the of the Monquist index. And further, uh, it seems natural to also then measure uh, efficiency change based on the regression residuals. If we estimate the model, then I I, had, I denote there's a uh, regression residuals by e. So obviously the the ratio of this uh, residual imperial t plus one and, and imperial t would uh, could be a kind of proxy for the efficiency change and then as a result we can we can think about the productivity change like like the Monquist index as the product of the technical change and efficiency change so a couple of points here are, are worth noting so so this is a very simplified presentation uh, so one thing is that I, I here just uh, excluded this uh, scale efficiency component. So uh, of course, uh, to make it uh, confirm with the, with the uh, usual uh, Monquist index or the index number uh, measures of productivity, we should make sure that this uh, uh, production function f uh, exhibits constant returns to scale. So you can think about, in fact, this uh, ratio of observed output and the production function which represents the potential output. So that could be this kind of level of productivity. And then if we look at the change in this uh, uh, ratio of actual output to the potential output, it would be the measure of productivity. But to match it with the, with the usual index number things, then, then we need to have that um, production function f exhibits constant returns to scale. And we can, we can of course, impose it uh, in, the, in the estimation. Another thing is that I jumped quite uh, directly to the conclusion that the efficiency change could be could be um, measured based on the residuals. Of course, if you think about epsilon as the composite error term, then then these residuals also are subject to the noise term. And uh, here comes, of course, then an issue that uh, what about uh, uh, should we should we uh, try to first isolate this kind of uh, inefficiency from these residuals using this kind of SFA techniques? Should we have instead some kind of JLMS efficiency scores rather than, uh, rather than uh, the residuals? Uh, so this is of course a little bit more, becomes a more questionable issue that is, is it valid to use the JLMS uh, decomposition uh, here or, or use, the, use this kind of JLMS uh, efficiency scores? Uh, I believe in, in uh, stochastic frontier papers, this, this is sometimes uh, done, but then we come, come to this kind of uh, issues, for example, that, that, that like, like uh, Wang and Schmidt noted in the context of these uh, Z variables, that this JLMS is a shrinkage estimator. So whether and to what extent then the noise should be counted in the, in the decomposition or not. So here I have just, uh, uh, just basically assumed that this, uh, changes in the noise term just cancel out over the long term. So if you are interested in, in uh, average efficiency change over some, some uh, uh, longer time period, let's say more than 10 years, then these changes over in, the, in the random noise term, if they are uh, independently distributed over time periods, then they should just cancel out. So what is left in this kind of uh, residuals is just the, just the efficiency change. So in my view, that, uh, that uh, argument uh, uh, cancels out this kind of need to really decompose the, uh, the error term for, for this inefficiency and noise components. Although I believe that in some studies that is also done. Another point worth noting is that I here assumed this uh, single output uh, production function. And this is uh, mainly because uh, I'm a little bit skeptical about these parametric formulations of the distance function and, the, and their properties as discussed in, in theme six. So uh, I believe that this kind of parametric uh, uh, estimation of the, of the production function uh, should be fine and, and for this kind of productivity measurement purposes, but for measuring uh, productivity in the multi-output setting, then, then uh, 
perhaps if instead of using some kind of distance function formulation, I would rather rather treat, for example, if we have bad outputs, I would treat them as, as inputs and, and have a single output uh, characterization. What about then the unified framework that I have referred to as the, as the stone? So there are obviously two approaches that could be pursued. So one is that, uh, that follow this kind of DEA type strategy and estimate yearly cross sections uh, separately. And this kind of uh, strategy has been pursued by, by Cheng Björnal and Björnal. And, uh, and uh, this, this would be kind of uh, then become close to this kind of standard DEA type of treatments. Uh, we can just estimate the distance functions. Uh, or if we can first estimate the frontiers for each, each year separately, and subsequently, we could use, for example, DEA techniques to, to calculate the distance to this uh, uh, intraperiod comparison. So if we have some observation in, in period T and we need this distance to the frontier in period T plus one, for example, then we can just use the fitted values of the stone frontier in the benchmark technology and apply, apply this kind of DEA techniques to calculate these required distance functions. However, I think in this, uh, this choice, I would be more in favor of using the parametric modeling of the time trend. Uh, so uh, in the next lesson, I will, I will discuss an application where I have uh, used this kind of parametric modeling of the, of the technical change using the time trend. Because in this uh, uh, stone framework, we can easily, easily use this kind of uh, parametric structure, like, like we discussed in the context of the Z variables. So this kind of time trend, we can think about it as just one, one of the Z variables and, uh, and model it uh, in a parametric fashion. So that avoids this kind of problem that, uh, that this um, technical change com component would be fluctuating over time. Uh, of course, this first approach can be, can be useful if we have a relatively large, uh, large cross section. So it's meaningful to uh, estimate it separately for each year we have, if we have a very large sample size every year. And uh, of course, this kind of uh, DEA type uh, approach would be, would not require this assumption that the technical change is necessarily Higgs neutral. So there could be so-called biased technical change if, uh, if for example, uh, capital becomes more productive over time than labor, then there can be this kind of biased technical change. So I also want to mention that this study by Cheng et al is also interesting in the sense that they they show that uh, the distributional assumptions of, of stones, so they consider also the inefficiency term separately. So they show that um, for the overall productivity change, so the Malmquist index, it doesn't matter what kind of distributional assumption we make for the inefficiency term. We might have a half normal or, or um, uh, exponential, or, or just leave it more unspecified if it just use the, the convex regression and, and measure the average practice, uh, average practice frontier. So it doesn't matter for the Malmquist index and the productivity change. This is mainly because uh, the Malmquist index really requires this distance function essentially for the shadow pricing. So as long as the shape of the frontier is the same, it doesn't matter how much we would shift the frontier. However, if we, if we make this uh, distributional assumptions, then, then it does matter for the decomposition of the Malmquist index to these components of technical change and efficiency change. So that, uh, that decomposition or those subcomponents sub of, uh, of the Malmquist index can be influenced by the distributional assumptions of how much we shift the frontier uh, in the second stage of the, of the stone procedure. Of course, this result to some extent is an artifact of this uh, modeling approach, making this kind of yearly, yearly cross section. So, so this kind of issue is also overcome completely if we, if we use a parametric uh, trend for, the, for measuring the technical change. So that's perhaps also one of the reasons why I prefer this uh, uh, second approach of using the, using the parametric time trend, because then it is not really uh, this uh, distributional assumptions do not play any role. And, um, and, uh, and, uh, and I find this distributional assumptions relatively arbitrary that there's not really good reason to uh, prefer one distribution over another for the for the inefficiency term. 
So in the next section, I will, I'll briefly illustrate to you then uh, the Malmquist index in its in uh, in this context of the of the productivity growth, and I also consider so-called green productivity growth, uh, considering the uh, bad outputs.